we already have 28 very punctual participants in the room. So thank you for being on time, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll just be waiting for a few more audiences to come on in. Hi, for those of us who just joined us, thank you so much for being on time. So we're just going to be waiting a few more minutes for the rest of the audience to come on the stream and in. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just thought that before, as we wait for more people to join us in this session, it will be interesting for us to also be able to take this time to really reflect, right? And to check in with where we are. If there is something that this webinar could give to us, what would, it, what would we like it to be and why? So if I may invite everyone to scan this QR code or go to menti.com, 57368805. Then we can have all the thoughts that you have and to see, you know, how can we best make this webinar something that you can gain from. And some of the thoughts that you have here as well, we can bring it into the panelist discussion much later. So once again, if any of you have just joined in to this session on enhancing the growth and well-being of our employees, we would love for you to scan this QR code to share with us if this webinar can give you something, what would it be and why? I'm sharing some of the responses that have already come in to know how to have better relationships with employees, how to support our, our staff for care and retention. If there are any other thoughts that you have about what you hope this webinar can give to you, do share it here as well. Thank you for the input that's coming in. So us wanting to know how to better support the well-being of employees, 
how do we actually have such kind of discussion about raising what is going on for us without being marked? Discussion, tips and concepts, sustaining and maintaining um, the growth and well-being of team members in the organization. Learning how to be a better leader to support employees in their professional development and make them feel more engaged, especially for remote teams. Okay, really knowing why well-being is a bigger issue nowadays. And how can we encourage employees to focus on theirs and employees' mental welfare? I think that's really important because uh, from an employer perspective, we are also humans. So needing to support our own well-being is uh, definitely key. Right. And um, for those of you who have just joined me or haven't put your thoughts in here yet, feel free to keep placing them in here. We will come back to that much later on and we will be able to see them as well. But over here, I would like once again to officially welcome everyone. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shane. I'm a member of SG Tech Singapore Enterprise Chapters Executive Committee and the Managing Director of Savoy Asia Consulting. On behalf of the SEC, Welcome to the Enhance the Growth and Well-Being of Your Employees webinar. Today's session is organized by the Singapore Enterprise Chapter in partnership with the Growth Collective SG and is specially designed with key decision makers, including business owners and HR management professionals in mind. We hope you'll find it useful. So to Shane, get the... Shane, maybe stop. You can see your script. Show the full slides. Ah. Uh, Yep, thanks. So to get the ball rolling, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Alex Ng, who is the chairperson of the Singapore Enterprise Chapter, to share the opening address. Hi, good morning, everyone. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks. Thanks again for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I just want to applaud all of you for taking time to join us at this webinar. I think it's an important topic and it says a lot about how you care about your employees and for your business. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Alex. I'm the Managing Director of Space Ventures, a venture capital firm, and I'm also the chairman for Singapore Enterprise Chapter. So SEC is the largest chapter in SG Tech uh, and we welcome all Singapore enterprises to join us uh, and we work collectively to network share knowledge um, through webinars like this and share partnership opportunities and so to help member companies in SEC to grow through various initiatives that we have throughout the year. Um, so today the committee uh, has <clears throat> planned this in partnership with both teams um, to organize this very interesting webinar. And I'm sure many of us have heard of a classic conversation or, or joke, if I may say, uh, where the CFO, very conscious of RI, asked the CEO, um, why do you keep sending employees for training? What if you train and then they leave? And then the CEO turns around and say, what if we don't train and they stay, right? And I, I think training is important, but beyond training, it is also important to ensure that our employees continue to progress and for us to be able to enhance the growth and the well-being in a very sustainable uh, manner for, for all of them, right? So all of us know in the past two and a half years, COVID has affected many things in our personal lives, in our business. From my own perspective, uh, out of 50 other companies, portfolio companies that we have, about half are education technology companies. And we, treat, we see this through a very magnified plus where schools and lives are very seriously impacted, not just in Singapore, but across the entire region. And, and as we see remote and hybrid working uh, arrangements have also started to blur lines between work and life at home, right? So we, we see that employees are struggling to cope, to balance between their duties, both work and, uh, work and at home, and actually those with young kids and for with people that need to care for. Right? On the other hand, we also see that employees are now starting to reimagine the way work should be. They're rethinking careers, work conditions, their goals, and the freedom to work from anywhere, right? leading to the great uh, resignation phenomenon. And I just heard another one called the silent resignation uh, phenomenon. So these, these are things that I think we should really think about and see what can we do to really... Uh, 
help and, and sort of cater to this. Uh, but the larger question here is how do we continue to attract, engage, and retain our employees and also to continue to enhance the growth and well-being of these employees in a very sustainable manner? Which brings me to today's topic. Um, and the organizing team has also invited a very solid panel of speakers and they will be sharing more. Uh, so I'll end here to pass it back to Shane to kickstart the session proper. Back to you, Shane. Thank you so much, uh, Alex, and apologies to everyone earlier. <laughs> um, so our first speaker, Shamanta Yen, co-founder of Growth Beans and also chairperson of the Growth Collective SG Steering Committee, is someone who has been actively working on enabling the inclusivity, well-being, and employability of people in organizations, whether it's through working with organizations directly or through the public run programs that they have. She will share on why supporting employee well-being is an imperative. And us welcome, Shamanta. Hi, thank you so much for that. So I'm just going to be sharing my screen. So I'm really heartened that we're all here today uh, to talk about employee well-being and how it's important. I think um, with COVID itself, it's really brought this very much to everyone's attention. Um, and bring it to the forefront of a lot of conversations. And it is very important for several reasons, and I'll share that uh, later on. But also looking at the Mentimeter questions, I think it's also very heartening to see how much care shines through from everyone. And also knowing that none of us are really alone in this, uh, handling this particular um, situation or challenge or issue, or even just this topic itself of well-being. And that at the end of the day, uh, we can care for our employees' well-being. But at the same time, as I continue sharing about this, it's also important to think about it from uh, your own individual perspective, especially if you're an employer. Because even as an employer, you also have your well-being to take care of. So um, just to do a very quick introduction. Um, so I, as mentioned by Shane, I'm co-founder of Growth Beans. And really um, in Growth Beans, we look towards uh, go, uh, having people and individuals in companies or in communities to grow meaningfully in a connected world through enhanced self-awareness, people skills and well-being. And um, this is very much done through coaching infused programs um, as well as coaching. Then I'm also um, sitting on the steer co of a growth collective as the chair. And in growth collective is pretty much formed by seven other different organized, uh, six other different organizations together with growth beans. Um, so it's really to build a world where everyone can feel supported and no one is alone. And we can do that through growth circles within communities. Um, just also to add that growth circles is recognized by the SG Mental Wellbeing Network which is really a government initiative to bring partners and citizens together to strengthen mental health and well-being outcomes for Singapore. So I think when we talk about well-being and health it itself, it's very important to think about what exactly does well-being mean? Do we all even have the same definition of that? Because if that's not clear or we all have different definition, then I think our approach for it could also be very much different. So here I'm offering what uh, WHO has defined health and well-being to be, which is basically health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So oftentimes, I think uh, we, we tend to look at this employer well-being, like, you know, when someone is ill or not ill, but this actually brings to mind that there could be a lot of other aspects that is not visible that we do need to take note of. Um, because when we talk about well-being, whether it's not just beyond the physical, when we look at mental and social, these are different aspects that's going on within that can influence the way we cope and the way we interact every day. And that itself is the key point uh, that I think we will all like to be able to know how to address here. So why exactly is employee well-being important? Uh, if we just quickly look at some facts and numbers, um, well-being itself, employee well-being, then they're very much about our talent. And when, when our talent, they are, you know, they are very much affected in terms of uh, the ability to regulate their emotions, um, they feel burnt out, it can actually affect productivity and then therefore uh, the impact on your company's revenue. A household, so um, 
there might you might also have seen some articles lately on um, by the Straits Times. Companies in Singapore in danger of losing talent over mental health and fatigue woes. Um, this was conducted by uh, Mercer, um, called 2,600 Human Resources. And, and it is real that there are a lot of uh, employees facing stress on the ground, and some of them already have at the top of their minds, should I quit my job? So in the same, in the same poll, um, it is found that about 66% of employers in Singapore are taking additional steps uh, to address mental health challenges, where else there is opportunity for more of the other employers to step up. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, with all of you here, um, you belong perhaps to the 66%. Um, so when we talk about potentially having our employees leave the company, then if we go back to this slide, then we are actually looking at potential challenges of how do we engage and retain our staff so that it leads to lower rate of vaccination? And then if people do leave, I think all of us know the pain of hiring. Uh, the process is long and there's a lot of effort and time cost that goes into it. So these are some things that we can take note of. And then in order to prevent that, what can we do as employers to attract and retain? I think here are some of the statistics show that people who feel cared for actually do stay longer. So why beyond the facts and numbers, I think it's also important to think about um, this notion of safety. I think in every workplace, there is a very big health uh, safety component, but I do think that we do need to now think of it from a different point of view or in, in the sense of psychological safety. As we hope all of as we hope every single person can bring their whole selves to work to be their true authentic self, um, then this psychological safety becomes even more important. Where people feel safe to be who they are, people feel like a big sense of belonging, where people can learn, and where they feel safe enough to challenge and be challenged towards a bigger goal. And why, why is this so? Because you know when you think about when you cut yourself or you hurt yourself, there is pain there is also emotional, social pain or psychological pain and the pain is equally real. And that itself can impact the way we work. Now, the second thing also, it's about trust, loyalty and engagement. I think COVID has really put, has been a very challenging time for a lot of businesses. And as we go through a lot of transformation, as we make changes, we also hope that our employees stick with us um, to go through this difficult time of change. And at the same time, they too hope that we have their interests at heart and that we have their backs so that we can stick through together through thick and thin. Now, there was a company that we spoke to before and some of their, their employees, and they talk about empathy. And especially when we talk about, uh, you know, how with COVID affecting everyone, not just us at work, but even our, our kids, who might now have to have home-based learning and so on and so forth, then that flexibility that we give to our employees becomes even more important. And sometimes that is what it, that is the key thing that employees are actually looking for. That extra additional empathy and understanding from their bosses. That itself helps them to know that this is an organization that really cares for me and I'll do my best also to stick with the organization. Then if you think about um, sometimes when you have, when you speak to different individuals, I don't know whether you've um, had a, an experience where you ask someone about their experience in their workplace and you get two potentially different kind of answers. One person could be, you know, um, suddenly changing in their whole composure and then say, ah, oh, yeah, this, it's not good, and then like, the boss doesn't understand um, as one potential example. And where they might even go on to say, yeah, you know what, next time, right, don't come over to this company to work because they really don't care. Where else, there is another group who actually responds to say, oh, I really love the company, and they go on singing, singing praises about the company. So when we see the impact of the culture of the company, 
um, on an individual and how it impacts their well-being, it actually translates into how they talk about the company, how they feel for the company, and it translates also in how they interact with potential clients, existing clients, and um, even internal, internal clients. So this, this is about how um, every single employee can also be a walking ambassador for the company, as well as uh, promoting good team culture and bonding with, because with the belief that every happy employee whose well-being has been taken care of can lead to uh, many things, including happy customers, happy organization, ha happy employers. So I think there was a question in Mentimeter that asked us about why now? Um, and I think there are many different reasons for that. And here are just four of them. Um, with COVID itself and also different work uh, arrangements, some of us might be working full-time remotely. Some of us might be going back to the workplace. Some of us have hybrid work arrangements. Either way, there needs to be a balance of like human connections versus social anxiety. So let me just give two examples. Um, there is someone that we spoke to before who just joined a company. And for the entire year in the company, this individual with remote working has never seen a single other colleague. Because even when we have Zoom meetings, all videos are turned off. So that itself uh, kind of like breaks the rapport between the person and everyone else in the company and not being able to see facial expressions make a difference. So in another instance, someone was saying, yeah, you know, we always have a lot of uh, chats in the, in the company, but I'm not sure what tone it is that they are saying it in. I'm not sure how to interpret it. And worst, in a worst case scenario, sometimes the language that we use or the choice of words can impact people in different ways when the tone and the context is not uh, clear. On the flip side, there are some individuals who have been working at home for quite a while that to step out can actually introduce some form of anxiety. So there needs to be some way to then manage that uh, from the employer's uh, and company's perspective. So also the speed of change and digital transformation also requires us to think about the way we learn, unlearn, and relearn. And with the speed of which things are being done, it also does introduce a lot of different uncertainty, a lot of expectations, um, and it can be overwhelming. On top of that, it's also very important to consider the changing expectations of uh, people in general. So over here, we have changing employee expectations on work culture, as well as the way leaders engage and retain. So with different individuals that we've spoken to before, I think we're starting to see a shift where individuals as employees want to be heard, want to be able to contribute. Um, and that also shifts the mindset away from traditional leadership concepts towards one of more service leadership, and which is also quite important because as things become a bit more ambiguous and uncertain, then as leaders, we might not always have the answer. And sometimes it's very important to be able to tap on the strengths, experience, and skills and wisdom of every single person within the company. Then that also brings us to the next point on changing expectations on work, um, where these days um, the younger generation do really seek more purpose, contribution, and autonomy in the workplace. And that's what's required to engage them. Now, I also just like to share something here um, in, in China News Asia recently about how millennials wanting to retire early. Um, and that really says and speaks very much about how people are feeling. They want to retire early so that they actually have time to do the things that they like. But there's two extremes. So on one hand, there are those who are working super hard so that they can earn the money that they need for early retirement so that they can enjoy life. On the other extreme, uh, there are those who are really seeking work-life balance um, and really trying to, to live life meaningfully every single day. So that itself can have an impact on the way people want to engage in the workplace. So in Singapore, uh, it was found that uh, in, in a sample of 25 countries, we have the sixth lowest employee engagement rate. And that is something that really 
requires us to think about much further. So going back to this, with just these four different elements, as well as COVID, um, we, we leave life as though uh, it's pretty normal now. But I think one thing that we overlook is that COVID still exists. The fears and concerns of COVID and COVID impacting family members and different intensity or different impacts on health, it's still a concern. It's still a worry. And that also can take someone's mind off the actual work. So when we look at impact on an individual level, uh, considering all of this, there can be an impact in terms of how someone feels connected. And at the end of it is also to the extent to which someone's emotions is influenced and affected. And with the speed of things being changed is how much environmental mastery they have over the work that needs to be done. And that can impact their sense of self, autonomy, and also um, purpose. Okay, because uh, after a while, when we are just doing and doing and doing, we might forget, why are we doing this? So then it's very important uh, for us to always remind and align our organization employees um, as a team. What is it that we're working towards? What are we striving for? So just to share some quick insights from a program that we do run with Growth Beans called the Find Your Ikigai. Um, it's really a program to help someone to know more about themselves and interests and their strengths and their purpose. And through our experience with over two, about 300 individuals, there are some stories that are coming out about how, and I'll share three of them, how there are some individuals who talk about my boss that affect, who affects my well-being. And this could also be instances where an individual could be stepping up in their role trying to manage a lot of different things, but feeling a little bit overwhelmed. And they might reach out to the boss and talk about how they might cope. But as a boss, and I'm not sure how you all might respond to such a, a situation, in this case, um, there are many different ways. Either we sit down with the individual to really hear the person out and then to co-create a solution together, or we could go directly into problem-solving mode and work based on the most efficient way to do things, sometimes including taking the entire responsibility of the person and giving it to someone else. That itself, every single action has an impact on the individual. It can impact the way they feel about themselves um, even more. And I'll share a little bit more about that um, in, a, in a later slide. That can also contribute to inner critique. Um, and inner critique can come from so many different places, the expectations the world has on us, our family has, the employers have of us, and even just ourselves. So when, when there is inner critique, that it does influence our, uh, an individual's worldview. And sometimes it's about how we as a team can support someone's inner critique by reflecting a different perspective back to them. So on the third note, uh, with some of the participants, they do talk about, oh yeah, work is just work and that's why I'm here. I'm trying to find purpose and meaning and trying to reconnect with that. So there are many different things that motivates an individual beyond money. And I think as employers, it's very important that we begin to sit down to really understand what makes them feel connected to the work. What is it about the work that they enjoy? Uh, what is their dreams? And so on and so forth. Now, when we also went on to do a survey of what they feel the world needs, then of 210 different participants, they do feel like they need more compassion. They feel the world needs more compassion and psychological safe space, more focus on good health and well-being, as well as empathy, so that everyone can really understand uh, each other and also have that space to build authentic relationships and have more trust for one another. So when, when we talk about that, I think it's important to note that um, actually we as human beings, we are all fundamentally the same with a shared human need to feel safe, to be happy and to not suffer. And, and when we talk about suffering, there are different things that can actually impact each and every one of us. And it's important to know that our triggers are different. What might affect my well-being could be slightly different from the factor that affects yours. The triggers are different, the circumstances are different, the degree of pain is different, but the experience of suffering is the same. 
And that is something that we cannot overlook. And that is something that we cannot dismiss or invalidate. It is something that we need to embrace and talk about. Because in talking about it, it helps us feel connected. It helps us feel that we are not alone. It helps us feel that there is someone who is ready to listen to us, reach out to us, understand us. It's not about problem solving for us, but at least giving us the space to feel connected. So maybe this is a chance where I'd like to invite everyone to just do a very quick reflection because earlier on, we mentioned about how even though it's a conversation of about employee well-being, well-being is something that impacts every single one of us. So there is this thing called a mental health continuum that breaks, um, breaks down how we look at mental health and the state of well-being in four different areas, from healthy to reacting, injured and ill. And ill is something that perhaps we might tend to always be focusing on, but there are a lot of other different elements that we do need to also consider. So as you look at um, the different uh, words below, I invite you to think about what's, which category in this continuum might you be at. And it's not just necessarily a category because it's a continuum, so you could be at the extreme end here, or it could be somewhere in between or more towards the other end. So if you are reacting, it could be that you are showing signs of irritability, impatience, nervousness. And then um, with in, being injured, it's feeling starting to feel more hopeless. And this is a constant move between uh, the left and the right. And it's important to know where and how you show up, as well as how you are able to take note of these different signs in the people around you. Okay. And what actually can influence our movement from left to right uh, towards reacting and injured? It could be basically the daily hassles. It could even be situations that trigger threat in our brain. So daily hassles could be things like deadlines. Um, it could be things like, a, you know, as parents, how do we manage our children and our work? Um, it could be the root people we, we meet with. Now, when we look at situations that trigger threat in our brains, then these are different elements that can trigger that. And here is where we introduce the SCARF model. Um, SCARF really stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. So in the instance where if you feel like someone is always putting you down, whether they put you down in front of their other people, in front of like colleagues, clients, and so on and so forth, it can, make, it can diminish your sense of self and your self-esteem. And when we look at certainty, when, when a lot of things are going, are happening, but yet there is no clarity in terms of direction, there's insufficient communication, um, that can influence the sense of certainty that someone has. If we micromanage, that can affect autonomy. When we are not connected with people around us, when we are not sure who are the people in our teams or in other teams, that can also affect relatedness. And of course, fairness, um, the best way to explain that could be things like favoritism. So when, when these different factors are affecting us, it triggers a threat state in our brains and that can overwhelm us and it leads to fear, anger and anxiety. And it might also color our worldview and we tend to see things in a worse off situation um, and then triggers the way we react and behave to the people around us. It might result in self-criticism, avoidance, or destructive patterns. So this is something that we do need to take note of as employers. How then are we considering the impact of our people in these five different areas? Now, if we go back to the mental health continuum, there are other events that also happen that we do need to take note of that can also cause stress. So major positive events can also cause stress, for example, moving house or even getting married, basically any new transitions in life. Major negative events could also be things like um, someone who in the family who's hospitalized, someone who's going through divorce, um, or there's a family crisis that can impact an individual. And it's important to see that when we talk about bringing a whole self to work, this is us right in the middle where we are trying to manage both work and family. 
And with COVID itself, I think we see greater integration of that. And as an individual, we can feel daily hassles, situations that trigger us from both aspects, um, into, in both spheres of our lives. And situations that trigger threat can also be things like judgment. So these are things that we do need to consider. And if we do not process these enough, um, along with other factors, it can slowly lead to burnout. And burnout sometimes can, depending on intensity, can be between reacting as well as injured. So it could be somewhere in between here. So when we talk about burnout, it's where someone might feel very much exhausted, feeling a depletion in energy and having no capacity to do more. It can also result in reduced efficacy. So when someone feels that sense of uh, inadequacy, it might affect their self-esteem. It might also affect their confidence in making decisions. It might also affect um, their own sense of their ability to do something, which then also results in making more mistakes. There can also be negativity and cynicism. And these are things that we do want to take note of um, as signs in our colleagues. So these are other factors of burnout that we do need to consider. If someone is experiencing burnout, it could be any one or combination of these factors. So these are things that we, and you would see that there's actually a correlation between these factors here, as well as what was shared earlier on in the SCARF model. Okay. So when someone is experiencing stress or someone is experiencing burnout and we want to ensure that they stay within the healthy reacting zone or actually move back towards the left of the continuum, it's important that we help them to process their thoughts and emotions. And that itself takes time. And when we can do that, um, it helps us to look at our, regulate our composure. It can also help us to learn from the experience and build tenacity. What can we do differently next time? We can also reconnect and shift our perspectives because sometimes when we are too much uh, in tune with only one single perspective and which is also within a negativity space, we might lose sight of the bigger purpose and meaning and it's important that we reconnect with that. And also it's important that we look at what is our inner resources and our inner strength and giving time and space to re-explore that would be important to help someone to process emotions and thoughts. And also from a health perspective, we're not just talking about physical health, it's helping us to look at the boundaries that we draw to protect ourselves as well. And more importantly is that community uh, and collaboration about how anyone and everyone could be experiencing this kind of struggles, but we're not alone in that. And if we can actually have conversations within an organization to talk about it, that would actually really help. So it's important that the essence that we bring into helping people is that of compassion, um, really not just hearing someone out, but giving them the space um, and the knowledge to know that we are here to really want to support them and elevate that suffering. And as leaders, if we, and not just leaders, but, but individuals, if we can bring in this element of compassion um, from an organization perspective, um, you would see that it does actually impact um, profitability, quality, retention, relationships, engagement, as well as learning within the workplace. Okay. So therefore, I'd um, just like to share that from a growth means approach, um, it's important when we look at skills or when we look at helping someone to support themselves. Um, in terms of well-being, there are these three different elements of growing, of resilience, of meaning, of connection. But it is important then, how can we equip someone to be able to have the tools and be empowered to work towards this growth and well-being? Likewise, from a growth collective approach, then it's about how we break well-being down into four different elements of emotional, psychological, social, and spiritual, and look at how someone can support themselves individually. And then when they respond in the outward manner with the people around them, that can help with not just inner well-being, but also well-being as a group. So within the workplace, it's important to have this high quality connection of uh, being able to process these different elements and a facilitator because 
Um, sometimes we all have different fears. Can I actually speak up? Is this a safe space enough? What if someone judge me? What if they put me down? So having a facilitator to come in to actually help to manage all of that and remain that objectivity while embracing all emotions would then be very important. And within a structure, within an organization, then the roles and culture of the, of the kind of roles and culture that we want to set up to sustain these would then be very important because compassion is not just something within, we can set up a structure and system to sustain it. So just to end off, um, it's really about how well-being is a journey and it requires ongoing skills and effort. So with that, thank you so much. Um, and if you'd like to find out more information, you can actually check us out on our website. Thank you so much, Samantha, for sharing um, that very insightful um, you know, information on some of the things that we need to be mindful of, right? To know even for ourselves when we will go into burnout. Um, so earlier on in the session, just before I bring in the next speaker, I actually invited some of us to go to menti.com and use this QR code. And over here, we can already see that out of 13 people, it's about 50-50, where 50% 50 of us here um, who have responded to this survey are a caregiver in one form or another. So it makes it, it makes some um, good sense then for us to for us to actually understand what it is like through the lens of an employee with caregiving needs. And I'm sure about 50% of us here can already relate to what it is like to work, even as a caregiver. So I'd like to bring up the next speaker, Mr. Adrian Tan, who himself, as I listened to his story yesterday, has a lot of experience as a caregiver himself, and it really influences the way he makes his decisions. So may I invite um, Adrian, who is the co-founder of SG Assist and also vice chair of the Growth Collective SG to share, please. Adrian, over to you. Thank you, so, so let me put up my slides. So right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. So um, I'm just pretty much going to share about um, some perspective from the employee angle, which is people like myself before I started SGSCs, as well as uh, some information that would be very helpful for you to, uh, to consider on uh, from the business, business perspective. So for a start, you know, Brad and myself is actually the co-founder for, for these uh, SGSCs. We came together way back in 2018 um, when we actually kind of like met each other in the uh, reservists. I'm sure a lot of guys can relate, you know, when we sit down at the canteen talking about our life, that's where they, we actually identified that caregivers are actually been um, struggling quite a little in terms of how we manage between work and our life commitment and, and many more. So because of that, um, we gathered a few more other caregivers who are friends um, to, to start off SGSCs. And if I were to give some context, um, I'm a caregiver for the past 15 years to my mother who have unfortunately suffered from breast cancer. And um, she got into depression and anxiety uh, on the second year of her recovery journey. And thereafter on the fifth year, she got the breast cancer again. Uh, it wasn't an easy journey for a young caregiver like myself, uh, not because that I don't have family support, um, my father uh, uh, is also caregiving for my mother, but unfortunately, my mother rejected him because of her depression. And even at, at the point, they almost got divorced because of the situation. So um, when I took over the caregiver role, um, many things were um, hindering in terms of uh, how I take care of myself. You know, um, having had gone, gone through drink when I was only 21, I was still studying. Um, I had to juggle between work, um, looking after her, as well as perhaps um, handling some of the relationship with my friends and so on. And there are times whereby I have to justify to my um, su supervisors or superiors saying that I have to take urgent leave because of caregiving. And as most of you who have imagined 10 years ago, uh, Caregiving to someone with mental health issue is not something that any, everyone can comprehend. Uh, I was seen at times that I'm taking advantage of the you know, medical leave or annual leave system, trying to avoid work. And frequently that resulted in me uh, seen as someone who 
couldn't uh, perform at work. So there are many other situations that, uh, that affects my life, including the relationship with my other families and relatives who are also burning out because of the caregiving, juggling between caregiving um, for my mother as well as their own career. So because of that, um, this is one key statement that we really wanted made, um, the most of you here to, to bring back for, um, when you're supporting some of the, the caregivers within your company that care is a responsibility that no one should shoulder alone because um, eventually every one of us will get there, that will need this support. So just for a start, um, why we actually wanted to do what we do is because we felt that a lot of caregivers couldn't find any help out there, which is what we're going to talk about today. And as I can prove to you, maybe from here, is that as she started a mobile app, we uh, encourage caregivers and also social services to download our app to find volunteers in the neighborhood. We have about 5,000 volunteers island-wide and about 3,000 over cases uh, set, uh, supported for the past one, two years. The amount of caregivers uh, and people who felt that caregivers needed help are tremendous, as you can see from the, the tractions in our mobile app. And also um, taking a step forward in terms of how we can support caregivers, we started looking into how we can provide um, more support to caregivers, such as providing a 24 7 service to help them in navigating the, care, uh, the caregiving ecosystem that is fragmented. Uh, they don't want to touch too much about our service, but the reason why, why I shared all this is because <clears throat> as we do what we do in SGSCs, we see that there's so much more people who need the assistance. As you can see in this research, that um, there are approximately 1.8 million people who are caregivers that belongs to the sandwich generation, which means that they're looking not only just uh, their elderly parents, but also their younger, gener uh, their younger uh, generation, such as their babies and their children. And according to another research, the productivity loss in Singapore due to absenteeism is about US 2.4 billion by 2030. So this is some of the impact that could also affect your company if we were to not giving enough support for caregivers out there. So just like what uh, Rosalind Carter actually once said, you know, there are only four people in this world, you know, those who have been the caregivers, those who will be a caregiver, those who are currently a caregiver, and those who really need caregiving. And unfortunately, within these four, the three, three of them will already be a caregivers, and perhaps all of us one day will become a caregiver for our spouse, for our children, for someone that we love, you know, basically there's no ending to, I would say everyone will end up becoming caregivers someday. <clears throat> so if you look at some of these newspaper on Straits Time, CNN and so on, it's obviously that we are not alone. You know, there are so much coverage about working parents burning out, you know, there's a, a need for better support for caregivers of uh, persons with disabilities, uh, persons with special needs, you know, and how actually all these um, caregiving issues actually affects our workplace. You know, as I, as I mentioned just now, all of us are going to be caregiver one day. And 94% of Singaporeans that's aged 35, 35 to 55 years old felt that they are under constant pressure to provide financial support for their parents and for their children. And 80% of the young Singaporeans aged 25 to 29 uh, expressed concern that they will fall into the next language generation. So these are some of the statistics that we can actually find over the uh, a lot of resources that you can um, Google for. But if you look at it, this all these numbers are very relevant to where we are right now. So um, just to give some clarity in terms of what we mean by sandwich generation, you know, the elder care challenges as you look after your parents, the strain with um, handling relationship with them, juggling your career and family. At the same time, if you are a married uh, person, you have your parental issues, long working hours, not having to spend enough time with your children as you see them growing up. And there's so, so much more that we have to handle, not just as a worker of, of the company, but as an individual living our life. And so, so therefore, a supportive work environment is vital in today's economy as we focus on helping more Singaporeans to actually take care of themselves so that they can work more productively so this is some of the statistics that I thought I could share with all of you today as the representative of your company or, or as a business owner. So there are many statistics showing that uh, women in Asia do four times as much unpaid care work than men. 
and 53 percent of women in Asia stay out of workforce because of unpaid care work. What do we mean by um, unpaid care work, which means that they are actually caregiving for their elderly parents or their children. But at the same time, there is a perspective that, or oh, not perspective, but there's a statistics increase that there are more men who are becoming caregivers that are not being uh, taken seriously off because there are so little people talking about it, right? So when it comes to seeking support, male caregivers have a disadvantage versus female caregivers as we tend to shut down um, ourselves when it comes to discuss about our thoughts and feelings. So this is not only just mentally exhausting, but it can lead to a lot of physical health problems that, of course, causing them to take more leave from work. So at the same time, the next thing is that how can we focus on employee well-being? All these testing sticks that you see is actually based on the research way, um, back in 2020. 47% of people have said that it actually affected their physical well-being um, and 35% uh, affected their productivity and performance. And if you look at the mental well-being and financial concerns, it's more than 60%, with mental well-being as the highest of 63%. And this is one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, look into how can we better support the mental well-being of individuals. So if you look at this, um, pay, uh, sorry, this newspaper article, it's actually also mentioned by President Mehta Halima in October 2021, that all these caregiving stress are so great that 210,000 caregivers are at, uh, gave out their career to caregive full time, losing their source of income, uh, struggling financially. At the end of the day, they could be very good employees that could support the growth of your company, but they had to give up their career because of caregiving. So if, if we were to tackle these two problems in terms of employee well-being and supporting caregivers, there will be your company will be able to achieve greater engagement as employees feel more motivated and uh, of when they supported, allowing them to empower by their organizations to balance both work and life, uh, family responsibility. At the same time, it will increase their productivity because they are less, less likely to be distracted and also perhaps taking less uh, annual leave or medical leave. And therefore, it will churn up, of course, greater loyalty among the employees to stay with you. Uh, as they feel more supported and it's something that they cannot get elsewhere. So for the business case, I kind of like summarize for every uh, every business owner and company res representative today, that the key is to support all caregivers focusing on employee well-being and therefore achieve employee retention. So um, that's all for my sharing for today. So uh, if anyone of you want to find out more about what we do or how we can perhaps support more caregivers out there, uh, feel free to contact us. If not, I'll hand over our time back over to Shane. Thank you so much, Adrian. And of course, at this point, we know that there are different people asking for the slides. So we just like to share that at the end of the session today, there will be a post survey questionnaire, and anyone who has completed this, you will get the, the slides. Um, and of course, uh, if there are any questions that you might have, we invite everyone to put your questions in the Q&A segment so that we can also use that when we move into the panel discussion later on. For this next segment, I will be wearing the hat of also the steering committee member of the SG Mentor Wellbeing Network, as well as the, you know, on top of my role as a co-opted member of the SEC. Here we are going to, here we are launching the campaign to support employee growth and well-being. And I just wanted to share a little bit. I'm not sure if anyone of you have heard of the of this um, SG Mental Wellbeing Network that was launched on the 16th of July by Moss Alvin Tan, which is a national framework, right? To a uh, national platform to bring partners and citizens together to take action to strengthen mental health and well-being outcomes for our society. So while it is helmed by the MCCY, it is actually focusing on all citizens in Singapore. And there is actually a plan to expand your focus to include workplace um, subsequently. So for us here at SG Tech SEC, together with the Growth Collective SG, we felt, how about us leveraging on this opportunity to start and support this national movement first? Because in this national movement, the, the plan is to launch well-being circles in all parts of the community. <clears throat> and a well-being circle objective is basically to raise awareness of mental health and well-being issues 
to train and equip citizens with the skills to look after themselves as well as that of others, and then to provide a safe space where citizens can support one, one another. So if we translate that into the workplace, it is really how can we better care for our employees as well as ourselves if, and if we have employers here you know, in, this, in this session to better manage ourselves, our talent. It can help a lot with reducing stigma in the workplace to also know who might be in the reacting phase um, and how we can actually support them early on. It will allow us to also develop critical core human-centric skills to support ourselves and to support others and to enhance the psychological safety and build deeper connections amongst employees, which I think the different speakers have shared about how this can tie back strongly to the element of employee engagement, the team building aspect, so that the company can thrive together. So the growth circle that um, the Growth Collective has is actually recognized as a well-being circle. And this is why um, we have formed this partnership to launch this campaign. Because the Growth Collective SG here, um, they basically provide a platform for individuals to practice the people skills. So I saw some of the questions that came in earlier on from the mentee meter. It is really about how can we help with the personal development of our people? And we know over here that some of this personal development or professional development goes back to human-centric skills or what we call also soft skills, something that Skills Future has been focusing a lot on the critical core skills as well, much needed for Industry 5.0. It's also that same platform where as people practice, they can also embrace vulnerabilities, which if we all subscribe to Brene Brown, it is the new courage that is needed and especially important for supporting well-being so that we can co-create the communities for genuine connections and that sense of belonging. So imagine this being placed in your own organization that can do a lot for cultural building, for creating that psychological safety. And the Growth Collective is made up of seven different organizations. So you will see it's a mix of social enterprises, um, that's both FINS, SGSS, Psychosocial Initiative, and PATO. Psychosocial Initiative, you will hear later on um, from the principal consultant. We have CPSS, so that's a community of people with lived experiences um, who are trained as peer support specialists. We have SACS, which, which is the Singapore Anglican Counseling um, Center, as well as SUSS. So in this partnership, um, the Growth Collective SG, they actually focus on the two parts, right? Growth in skills, where they tap on the growth facilitator, growth facilitator training, um, where they leverage on like um, looking at the national mental health um, framework to design a curriculum that really looks at the foundational skill sets to develop elements of like empathy, reflective listening, um, reflective questioning, active listening for participants. And then there is the growth circles session, which is two hours that can enhance well-being. Now, yesterday, um, I, also sat in, I was also involved in a session where we had people from different even from different countries, right? Coming in um, at sea level all the way to like, you know, from there were sea level people, there were managers, all, pe all of them were very influential people in their own areas that can make a difference. And when they came in together to experience these growth circles, they had their own area of growth in either emotional, psychological, social, and spiritual. An example, in a group of three very high profile folks, they were talking about what is like life purpose for them. But it's interesting when in the growth circle, they had the chance to actually share about this. What came up for them was different. One, one emerged, you know, having achieved a bit more of that emotional awareness or self-awareness that she was actually close to burn out. Another one, through the sharing, realized that, you know, there was a lot more that she could do. So she actually gained that confidence to want to be able to share more to create even bigger impact. And there were others who shared that, you know, the social element was there because they were able to connect with others much deeper in a faster way. So these are like the four areas of growth. So we focus on like the inwards first of an individual before that can be translated outwards into the culture, into the team that we work for. And that's the growth and well-being framework by the Growth Collective. So from there, just wanted to share for their growth facilitator training. It's a four days training program of which participants 
will emerge obtaining a certificate of attendance endorsed by the Singapore University of Social Sciences and the Growth Collective SG. And anyone who emerges from that will be able to practice that common growth language and framework for the well-being of employees. So imagine then being able to translate that back to the workplace. They are also able to support in creating that culture of psychological safety and growth with compassion. I think some of these are key words that Shamanta um, spoke about earlier on. And more importantly is the ability to practice and enhance that critical core skill sets in developing people and enabling their inclusivity. So reflective thinking, empowering others, perspective taking, emotional agility, and active listening. And these are also the same skill sets that we would need um, even when we are working with our clients. Um, let's say if you want everyone to be more consultative when they are working with the different stakeholders internally and externally. And then, of course, being able to provide psychological first aid. So what happens if someone in our organization has moved from stress level to a distress level? Then we will need to be able to step forward and provide that psychological first aid to them so that they don't spiral downhill. So this is an example of um, a, a quote from one of the participants of the growth facilitator training, someone who is in sales. So he said that it really enabled him to be more comfortable and confident in communicating his thoughts and feelings to others and to appreciate and accept differences you know, from other people's lives. So again, we can weave in the other component of um, how this can support um, diversity and inclusion at the workplace. For the growth circus, it's a structured two-hour face-to-face or online session in small groups um, where people really support one another. You, you heard me sharing a little bit about it much earlier on as well on um, how it impacted some of those C-level or high-profile folks. Now, this, and you, you would have seen from our EDM, the Johnson & Johnson Foundation logo. So this is actually a program that is sponsored by the Johnson & Johnson Foundation. So anyone coming to this program is, will come in free of charge. Even the growth facilitator training would be sponsored all the way to August 2022. Uh, sorry, August 2023. So the growth circles really then is a chance for people to be heard and to share and also be able to contribute. Now, what does that mean then? Like, why am I sharing all of this? And how is that relevant to the campaign? This is where we want to share about this um, well-being campaign, where as employers, we get to choose how we can support our employees' well-being. So you can choose to go down the advocate road first, and then later on, you know, do the activities required to be an ambassador and then the champion, or you can make a firm decision now that you want to go down the path of champion or you can do a mix of the various pathways. So as an advocate, we invite all of you to share about the growth circles with employees because growth circles are, they are public runs. So early on, you will see the face-to-face -face virtual as well as the, sorry, the face-to-face -face as well as the virtual sessions. Um, virtual sessions are conducted on Tuesdays on a weekly basis. And then if you want to be an ambassador, it is about bringing growth circles into your company so tapping on the growth facilitators that are already trained or even the mentors at the Growth Collective SG to come in to support your employee well-being and or have your employees join the public sessions. So that's where um, from the Growth Collective as well as SG Tech is being able to track that. Yep, you have employees that have joined the public session. That makes you an ambassador. Or you can think about it from a champion point of view where if you commit to sending your employees to be trained as a growth facilitator, then we will recognize you as a champion. Now, while we talked about how this is a sponsored program, there is an admin fee for anyone who is going down this path. And this is $150 per person. Why is, um, just to ensure that there's commitment because there's a lot of work involved in ensuring that someone is developed and trained to become a growth facilitator. So we want to make sure that that there's a commitment from that angle. So while we while that campaign is while this campaign is launched, we also want to recognize everyone who is participating in this. Um, and we would love to be able to brand any employers doing this. So if you come in as an advocate, we will recognize you on our Growth Collective SG website. If you come in as an ambassador, then 
you would receive a free one hour lunch talk on mental well being related topics. So this would be delivered by, um, by any one of us from the Growth Collective SG. And also be featured on the social media of SG Tech and the Growth Collective SG. If you come in as a champion, the Growth Collective SG will be having a launch event in the first quarter of next year. So that coincides nicely with um, just after the end of this campaign, which will end in February. And there will be an invitation to a political holder who will come in as a VIP. And then you get also to be featured on the social media of Johnson & Johnson Foundation, SG Tech, Growth Collective, SG. So the difference here between champion and ambassador is that from a champion um, angle, there will be even more in-depth coverage, like interviews and stories that will be shared of your organization and the, and the impact that is created. So how can we go about being part of this um, campaign? So there are different steps over here on what we have to do. And everyone will have to start off first um, completing the platform and to share this flyer um, that will be sent to you if you say yes to this to your employees to your employees. There's also an employee well-being booklet that you can also give to your employees to help them, to support them, and to repost your pledge from our social media with um, the given relevant hashtags and to tag us too. So all of us, regardless of whether we are choosing ambassador, advocate ambassador champion, we will go through that same path. If we want to move on to the ambassador pathway, then it's about sending our employees to growth circles within this six months um, campaign. For the champion, so after all of those, it's also necessary then to nominate at least one employee to join the growth facilitator training. And then what, you can, what this individual can do is to run a growth circle within, um, together in partnership with a growth collective mentor because the growth collective SG believes in continuing to support the professional development of any trained facilitators as well and to give them confidence to run the growth circle professionally and effectively within the organizations. So you can choose to run it within the company or if they choose to do this as a CSR, we have community partners also wanting to run this in the community. So the campaign timeline looks like this. Today is the launch of our growth and wellbeing campaign. And there is a deadline to submit the pledge form. So any one of us who's interested to join the campaign in the post survey questionnaire, you will see that there's a question for you to indicate that you want to get more information on this campaign. And that's where we will then send you all the details required to join this campaign. Okay. So between September to February next year, that's where all the different activities are to be done. And by 24th September, we will also reach out right to see if there's any outstanding documentation that is needed for us to conclude this campaign. And then in March or April, during the Growth Collective launch event, that's where um, it can be recognized. So you can see this is like the flow of it. So as a call to action, again, to participate in this campaign, complete the post-event survey and indicate your interest. And the email with details will be sent to you by representatives from the Growth Collective SG. If some of us are uncertain right now, but we want to experience the Growth Circus in a public run next Tuesday evening, 23rd August, 7.30 p.m., you can. So do scan this QR code over here to get more information. And because um, session, growth circles are run every Tuesday evening, you can have um, different members in your organization join it first to experience it, to determine whether you want to be part of the campaign. But if you already are experiencing it anyway, then, um, it's, then you might as well go down the, the ambassador pathway. So that brings me to the end of this um, launching of the campaign and we would be excited and we would love to see many of you join this campaign so that we can recognize you as well and to help the Growth Collective in partnership with SG Tech because um, for us, we have a CSR always on the go, right? Um, to really create an impact here, not only for our employees, but in the community to be aligned with the national movement. At this point in time, it brings, um, it brings us to the next portion of today's session, which is the panel discussion. And if any one of you have any questions that you would like to ask as well, do put it in the Q&A and we will, res we will respond accordingly. So um, I will be moderating this session and may I invite all the panelists and speakers to turn on your videos.
So I want to introduce Shamantha and Adrian because you've seen and heard them much earlier on. But please allow me to introduce our two other speakers on the panel, um, who is Ms. Faisal Abdul Hamid, a principal consultant at the Psychosocial Initiative, and Ms. Isabel Lim, who is Deputy Director, HR and Workforce Transformation from Excelling. So welcome to the panel. I think one of the questions that was um that maybe I'll I'd like to first ask is um to Isabel. You know, this conversation of employee well-being has been going on for a while. And you know what's working right now on how we support employee well-being and what do we see is missing? If, if you can wear the hat of you know of a HR <laughs> to provide us okay. a response, that would be great. Um hi everyone. So um, basically, well-being has been a very important topic, which actually come, you know, has obviously come to light during this COVID period, um, where people are, are very disconnected in the sense they're not in the same physical place anymore. And previously, when um, people are actually in the office, they're able to, to communicate together, to have lunch together, and, and feel supported in terms of uh, mental and emotional needs. So right now, I would say that that part has not been working. That has been one of the challenges. So now that um, the government has kind of tried to open up and encourage more people to come back to the workplace, uh, I guess one of the things that can really help to work now is that you're being connected more with seeing your colleagues um, in person. And having someone to listen to you or um, maybe try to sort of ask how's your day. For example, here in Excel Link, even though we are not all together all the time, we actually use our chat channels to actually greet each other in the morning. Now, that might not seem like such a big thing, but you know, something small as a gesture of saying good morning will actually help to start your, your day on the right foot, you know, um, and help to sort of set the tone for, I'm going to have a very busy day, but at least I know that somebody said good morning to me um, from the office. So I would say that some of the things that we practice um, in our company is that um, we also offer a flexi work arrangement, which is also one of the initiatives that the government is also trying to sort of encourage and support as well. And this is obviously in collaboration with some of the um, uh, managers or you know uh, management to sort of support how can we um, do our work effectively, but still support um, um, how the person is feeling. Maybe they're having a bad day. And um, recently, I would say we actually ran a health and awareness week um, in our company that sort of incorporated uh, physical and um, mental sort of exercises, including meditation. So during that week, I think because a lot of people were not exposed to meditation, for example, um, I actually led that session to try and get people, you know, to understand what meditation is about. So we actually did a very simple breathing exercise. And, and I was actually surprised by how uh, participative our employees were to actually have regular sessions. So I've actually been running that for the last couple of months to sort of help um, sort of slow down if people felt very stressed out. So some of the other things that I would say uh, that we would support well-being is very much having the organization or other companies to try and understand what the employees are actually going through while they're trying to work effectively um, through you know cycle of changes because you might have personal changes, you might have life changes like what was mentioned earlier. And sometimes they may find that their work performance are very much affected, but it doesn't mean that they're not committed or that they're serious about their work. So sometimes it's about really the company and the organization trying to understand what some of their stress factors are or what are the things that are um, bothering them, you know. So it's also very good to know that there's certain people in the organization that they can actually talk to beyond their manager, um, that they can feel very safe psychologically to, to sort of um, maybe share about, you know, what they're going through and how the manager or the person that they're speaking to can support, support them in, 
working more effectively despite the fact that they have these distractions. So that's the reason why I mentioned that we also have a flexible work arrangement. But at the same time, we want to encourage people to come to the office to have that bonding, to have that emotional connection. Because without that online, it's it, as you said earlier on, you know, people don't turn on their videos. So you don't feel connected because you're not looking at the person, right? Um, and also by being more aware and, and supportive, um, we want our employees to actually feel that um, that people are sort of helping them to find their place. You know, maybe for a while, they, they have been focused on their work and suddenly they are off the path. So, so we want to sort of encourage activities or more communication to steer them back to the right way to go about um, so that they can still continue to work and to achieve not only their work goals, but also their personal goals, you know, whether it's their career path uh, from a HR perspective. And, and this is really sending a message from the organisation that we are as an employer being very empathetic in supporting your well-being, but also to help you shape your career in the organization. So I hope that sort of answers the question. Thanks so much, Isabel, for sharing and some of the different initiatives that is also being done um, at your workplace. I'm opening up this question, the same question to anyone on the floor here, the, any of the panels, if you have anything else to add based on what you have heard. No? All right, then one of the questions I think that you know came up for me is that you talked about needing them to be in the office to connect. Um, I also understand like what Adrian said, you know, sometimes caregivers, they do need to work from home. Um, how, how do we keep them engaged and you know while managing their well-being? So what can employers really do to support? Adrian, if I can direct the question to you. So, uh, thanks, Shim. So, uh, to answer to the question, I guess also from Sharon, right? Um, I guess working from home isn't really the perfect solution either. You know, um, I'm sure most of you have tried to work from home. You will know all the challenges that you have. Uh, Wi-Fi not good la, you know, Mother yelling out there, and children running around. It essentially way more tiring working from home than working in the office, in my opinion. But yet at the same time, it offers them the flexibility to do what they do uh, in terms of juggling uh, with flexibility between their um, career and as well as their caregiver duties. But if I could um, perhaps uh, suggest some ideas to some of the business owners or company representatives over here, some of the things that we could easily do in terms of uh, helping perhaps tag reverse within your own company other than working from home arrangement is to help um, your employees to understand more about the different challenges that caregivers may have, especially those from different um, risk group, perhaps you know, those people who are dealing with uh, aging seniors or those people who are dealing with uh, family members with uh, disabilities or even um, intellectual disability. Um, Policies at the workplace uh, plays a big part, part as well in terms of how you can support them, uh, whether it's a paid time or um, flexible work ch challenges, uh, sorry, flexible work arrangements like working from home, but yet at the same time, helping them to be able to uh, perform their duties is actually quite a key, uh, I would say, offer that you can, you can provide to them as a support. Therefore, uh, the training and resources such as um, some, some of the coaching services that perhaps GrowBase can actually offer, or even for the mental well-being support where the Growth Collective is actually focusing on, as, in, as, you, as most of you can remember, uh, in my previous slides, 63% of the employees based on last year research says that uh, it affects their mental well-being. So having a free or even sponsored uh, Growth Collective uh, section, or to send some of your employees for the uh, facilitator training, could also bring a lot more value in terms of the training and resources where we actually help them to manage better so that they can actually support others better are some of the quick ways that you can achieve this. So um, I hope I answered the question that working from home is actually just one of the methods. There's so many more ways that we can choose support employees. Thank you, Adrian, for that. Um, Faisal, I'd just like to direct the next question to you. Um, 
you know, as someone who has been doing a lot more of like psychological first aid, how do you see that, you know, being more important in today's context? And um, to address one of the questions that have, uh, have appeared as well, it seems like employees can move into the crisis end of the well-being continuum. So how can someone equip frontline managers to spot anyone who experienced life crisis stresses? And what can we do to empower these frontline leaders who provide that tangible support to employees going through difficult times? I think that's an excellent question because I think as human beings, uh, when we are having some emotional issues or when we are really, uh, feeling down or emotionally distressed, we're often more comforted by the people that we know, by our friends, by our colleagues, uh, by familiar faces, rather than to ask them, okay, go and see a counsellor or go and see a EAP personnel, you know, because they don't, really, they don't have an existing relationship. So if you have frontliners or people within the same workforce, your colleagues, people you already know, and they are equipped with the training to identify people who actually uh, who are already stressed, but they can identify when does this stress actually has kind of like turned into a distress level where they need uh, more support. So if they're able to identify this kind of traits and signs, they're able to come forward and what we call offer some form of emotional support from a peer support level because peer-to-peer -peer is always more effective. Because the truth is that not everybody who's experiencing some changing situation in their life, like what Adrian was saying, uh, your parents fall ill, or your child gets sick, or your child is going through difficult time in school, got bullied, whatever. They are not in the end of the spectrum continuum. They are not actually having mental health issues. They are just emotionally distressed and affected by the life situation they're currently in. So they don't need actually need counseling. They don't, they don't need mental health intervention. What they need actually is emotional support. Uh, so if you learn psychological first aid, the skills you learn there will actually help you or build you the competency to be able to identify the signs, know how you actually can provide emotional support to people who are actually in this stage so that they don't need to actually go into the end of the continuum, they don't need to actually develop mental health issues or disorder, and they can be easily supported before that happens to them. Because by the time they get into the end of the continuum, before they already get a mental health illness, um, the way forward to actually support them will be quite more challenging. You need more resources, and of course, when more resources involved, it simply means more time and more money. So psychological first aid, just like medical first aid, is really an, a prevention from people, uh, for people who need help in that stage before they actually develop more serious issues like mental disorder. Thank you so much, Faisal. That's what I'm hearing. It's about <clears throat> being able to know on that continuum where, where, where we are at and what kind of support to provide, right? So yep. counseling will be on the far end and then um, anyone who is moving towards distress is really like psychological first aid. Yep. But anyone else upstream, that's where coaching comes in. Yep. And I think when we talk about coaching, it's also some of that um, softer skills or human-centric skills that Isabel talked about even at your workplace. So I'm just wondering, like Isabel, Shamanta, do you have any other inputs here for this question? <clears throat> how, how, can, how can we equip frontline managers to spot employees who experience life crisis stresses? So, so, uh, so maybe I can answer this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what is yeah, Isabel, maybe you can go first. Okay, sure. Um, I think maybe one of the ways could be because obviously um, frontline managers are not uh, psychologists and they're not trained per se. So maybe, um, you know, sort of training such as growth circles is a good way to also help frontline managers understand and empathize what an employee could be going through. And maybe that can sort of lead to um, having some mental, like uh, internal mental support groups within the organization in a smaller scale where people should not feel ashamed to actually share some of the mental health challenges that they face and, and sort of understand that, hey, there's other people that have actually gone through what I've been through. And maybe that could even start from the top, meaning maybe even the management could share in such circles or support, um, support chats, as it were. So that would be a, a sort of a good way and a gentle way to get to encourage people to start off um, opening up. And if they can see their management can actually be someone who can come down to the ground and actually open up, that will encourage them as well. They won't have to feel that it doesn't matter what level I, I'm working at in an 
organization, we are all human beings. We all go through mental health challenges. So um, I would say that's also one of the ways that we can try to, to handle that. That goes back to common humanity. Thank you, Isabel. Shamanta, you wanted to share your inputs. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Faisal and Isabel mentioned. I think it's really the importance of um, that relationship, that emotional support, um, being able to understand and empathize. And I think it all boils back down to two things. First is really that skill sets to really know how to support. Because I think when we speak to different individuals also, they say like, I want to support, but I'm not sure how. What if I support and it leads into a space which I'm not comfortable with or I do not know how to handle? Um, so, so that's one element of like first the comfort level within an individual to be able to uh, to handle or manage emotions um, for the self as well as for someone else and I think it's also about like really listening um, and holding the space for someone and besides that um, the, the, the key most important thing is knowing that as someone supporting someone it's not about problem solving for them is really giving them the space to process thoughts and emotions. Um, because what we see at the, at the first level might not be the real challenge that someone is facing. It might not be the real need. And therefore, to be able to hold conversations um, that enable them to really find out what is the real root of the issue before a, the right appropriate solution can come in for the person. And, and this solution may not always have to come from someone who's supporting. Um, the person might actually already have the answer. And I think this might also uh, address a, a question um, inside the chat by Sharon as well. So sometimes it's about really finding out what is that real need that we can address. And uh, for this skill sets, I'm just going to uh, also promote like with the Go Circus and Go Facilitation Training Program, that's where we also equip individuals uh, to really learn how to listen, how to look out for these different signs, and how to be present to hold the safe space for someone. Thank you. So I'm very mindful of time. So I thought what could be useful is that I would, some, I would combine the remaining questions together to form one question. And that could be like everyone's parting statement before we go into like the post of a um, question, right? Um, so, so we know that Singapore is like a perhaps an Asian society, could be backwards with all mentality, but of course government has been doing a lot of uh, awareness building. But given, given that there are still certain challenges, right? Like how people can share about themselves. Um, I think one of the things from Mentimeter was how can I share about my depression without getting repercussions? So how, how can we actually support the well-being of our employees as well as our bosses um, without fearing or without having any repercussions? Anyone who's ready with a response, maybe we can go around the room to share. Uh, maybe I share first, so we can, we can end up earlier. <laughs> uh, I think this is where, again, the idea of having a peer support a framework within the workplace is very important. Because uh, my experience as a psychological first aid uh, trainer at the workplace, even so, uh, people are more comfortable going up to the sphere to talk about this issue than going to see a counsellor because of the stigma revolving about it mental health, right? Um, so when I was doing it in my workplace, where everybody know I am the psychological first aid provider. People come to me naturally all the time, hoping to get some kind of emotional support, hoping to get some kind of conversation. They are more open and ready to actually have that conversation with people who are not mental health specialists in that sense. Uh, even the bosses will come to me and say, do you have time? I need to talk about something. And it, it turned out to be nothing about work. It's all about their emotional issues. So having that framework of having peer supporters at the workplace can provide this kind of conversation and, and time and emotional support actually is very important, helpful, and people don't need to actually go down the path of seeking mental health professionals. Thank you, Faisal. Isabel? Um, yes. So, so some, obviously, um, the tripartite, the, you know, tripartite has also stated that we're not allowed to sort of ask, you know, if you have a mental health condition. But uh, in a way, what we want to encourage is to sort of communicate to the employees that, 
you know, we have to treat mental health just like any other illness, that it's not going to preclude you from uh, being ostracized, you know, for being, you know, mentally unwell. But it's more about trying to share what are some of the challenges and how can the organization work together with HR and the employee to make them feel supported and how they can actually work in an environment to achieve what they need to achieve in terms of work. Um, so whether that requires uh, more conversations or more sharing and solution building, I think that's important because besides having trust between the employee, um, they also have to feel that this is an organization that's very empathetic and that it's not biased against you having uh, you know, depression, for example. And as just what Adrian shared, you know, caregiving is very, very heavy duty. And it doesn't stop you from wanting to give your commitment to the organization in terms of your work, but you also want to balance that with giving the commitment to your, to your family if you are being a caregiver, whether it's an elderly you know, parent or a relative that you need to support. So you have to work together to find a way that would allow the person to work smoothly without feeling the stress of, um, I need to, you know, deliver something, but to work together with maybe your other colleagues who can help to support you while you're not able to deliver certain things, for example. Thank you. Um, and maybe I direct the question to Adrian next. Thanks, Shane. So um, maybe for everyone here, um, I, I'm speaking from both perspectives, right? So as a employee previously, and as a, I would say business owner right now, I think there's so much more that we can do to support um, caregivers and, and employees, especially, uh, I will say right now, within my own organization, we kept the conversation very open. We felt that uh, there's a need for us to build a very open, um, I would say conversation among our employees so that they are willing to share their concerns with us, uh, as well as when we are hired, you know, as a as a boss ourselves, uh, we also will not hesitate to tell our staff that we are actually very tired right now, uh, burning out, you know, and how they can actually offer their own support by helping us to do some things here and there. Um, is being a small company, I felt that that's one of the things that we could achieve. But for some of you over here, um, I felt that if there's a way to uh, take your first step to support your employees into such conversation, you know, such as uh, getting to, uh, running a growth circle in your organization where people start to break down the, the barrier or the silos that they have in terms of or the self-protection mechanism that they may have with each other by opening up the conversation between your staff, between uh, you and your staff perhaps, so that uh, you can understand more of the other, some of the challenges that they may face and start uh, working on perhaps some changes and improvement in your policy or some approach of how you can support your, your employees better in passive work arrangement. So, um, yeah, that would be my suggestion. No, just being open and have conversations with your own employees or with your employer, <laughs> if I were to get this at the other way around. Yeah, back to you, Shane. Thank you, Adrian. And then, Shamanta, parting words from you as well. Yeah, I guess um, it, it's important to really embrace vulnerability. And uh, some of us might be employers, and then I think it's how what we choose to say and do is setting the tone for the rest to follow. Because if we talk about trust, then it's how can you first set that vulnerability and safe space up in, uh, in order for people to feel like they're, there's an invitation for them to also open up. Um, and then when someone actually does follow your footsteps and uh, share, then how can we show compassion and support them in, in the way uh, with the focus on emotions? And then I think if, if anything, feel free to always go to a go circle um, or maybe even seek coaching for a deeper processing of thoughts. Um, and I think in terms of that, sometimes we can always be talking about emotions, but it's not easy for someone else to really know what exactly it is we're trying to say. So it could also be talking about the intention that we're sharing and our needs. So I think that's uh, something to share. Thank you so much. So. Thank you everybody for being here and thank you to our panelists and uh, speakers for sharing. I think we've learned so much today. 
um, from every one of you and your experiences. I hope that every all our audience are walking away with some key tips on what we could start doing. And uh, more importantly, if you can scan the QR code over here to complete the post-event survey, all those who have completed it will receive the slides for today's session. And do click on the employee well-being campaign, growth and well-being campaign, as well as the different options so that we can follow up with you. We look forward to you participating in the, the campaign so that we can help you with developing the growth and well-being of your employees and your bosses in your workplace. Thank you everyone for being here. We will stay on here to and maintain the screen so that we can um and can also ask any questions if anybody else do have any other questions. Oh, well, thank you so much, speakers and panelists. You are very, very, very insightful, very inspiring as well. All the personal stories and how you guys really like, really believe in what what um the good and the importance of that this well being for employees and employers also <laughs> the quite interesting point. Um, it's really for the people uh, of Singapore. So I think um, yeah, I think all the answers and most of the answers have been uh questions have been answered. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to spend a bit more time still here if you guys have any more questions, uh, but continue to fill in the survey and do remember that we will be able to send you the slides only after you, you fill in the survey. Yes. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking a photo. So for the panelists, can I invite you to... Oh, sorry, Shane, can you go to the maybe thank you slide or maybe the first, the first slide? The... The uh, SG text like the 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 banner yeah event banner. In just a moment here, there's a lot of um. I have to hit back many times. <laughs> For this event, maybe? Yep. Yeah, awesome. So I'm going to take a photo uh, in three, two, one, okay? So I invite everyone to look at the camera, this street. All right, very good. All right, three, two, one. Wait, 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 let me try that again. <laughs> well, so after three, two, one, smile. Okay, three, two, one, smile. All right, great. Yeah, I got a good photo. So I'll be sharing it for everyone through email. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, yeah. Isabel, Shamanta, Adrian, Faisal. Thank you very much. Um, I think Thank that brings us to the end of the session today. And thank you for the 23 participants too in the room. <laughs> Looking forward to see you at the next SEC event. Thank you.
Okay. Um, just five at ten B. I'll 